All right. Well, thank, thanks, Glenn, and, and thanks to the to Mines and Wines Committee for the opportunity to, to talk to you today about what we're doing in inflection in the, the northern part of the, the Junee Narromine Belt. Um, for some reason, it's only my name that appears in the program, and uh, etc., which is definitely a mistake. I'm really the bit player here. I'd like to draw your attention to all the names there um, who have done actually done all the, the real work. So Doug Menzies, Alistair Waddell, uh, Carl Swenson, who are in the, in the audience here, as is as Josh Phillips, uh, Douglas Haynes, one of our key collaborators, and I'd also like to, to point out the real significant contributions of some other people, Jess Askew, who's in the audience, Terry Hoshke, who's also here, and, and Tony Shrek in the, the early days of our activities here in, in the Macquarie Arc, in the, the, the Juni Narromine Bill. So we are a, a listed company, we're a Canadian listed company, listed on the CSE in Canada, so you do need to be aware of the, the forward-looking statements, etc. here. So quickly, I'm just going to start with a little bit of a discussion around our strategy, how we got to where we are now and why we're doing what we're doing, and then I'll talk a, a little bit to, to what we've actually been doing, starting at the regional scale, working down to our target scale approach, what we're doing at the sort of more local scale, and then finish up with a little bit of a, a discussion around the, the future and what we have ahead of us. So I just want to start with, with this, this sort of view here. And we've heard a bit about some of these things already this morning in the great early presentations. And we all know that in, in tier one jurisdictions, if we think of countries like Australia, Canada, et cetera, then exploration is being increasingly driven undercover. And I've just put up a few selected examples there that, that all of you will be aware of, of discoveries in Australia that, that share the common feature of being discoveries by, made by pushing the extents of fertile belts, and I want to reinforce this word fertile as we go through. So these are discoveries that have been made by, by exploring undercover on the fringes or the interpreted extensions of fertile belts. And the distinction I'm drawing there in terms of when we start to look at covered exploration and start to build strategies for covered exploration is the fertility of the belt that you know about. So uh, is your belt where it's exposed fertile? If the answer to that is yes, then chase it for all your worth under the cover. This is not about going out finding new belts from fancy geophysical interpretation under cover. It's a very tried and true strategy of chasing belts uh, fertile belts under cover. And I think probably one of the earlier examples of that is, is in our backyard here, the cowl discovery. So in the late 70s and early 80s when the GeoPico team there in Parks had had their success at North Parks, or Ganumbla as, as those of us with the amount of grey hair I have prefer to call it, and thanks Greg this morning, um, that early success at Ganumbla was taken, that knowledge was taken by that time, team at, at GeoPico and Parks further south into what in that time was frontier territory. You know, that, that, was, that was out there, you know, and look what we've just heard about. So this is essentially what we're, try, what we're doing in, in inflection resources, but in a 2020s version of, of that. I would also make the point that in, in my view, and I might ruffle some feathers here, but that the Macquarie Arc is Australia's only fertile porphyry belt. Doesn't mean there aren't other porphyry, porphyry systems elsewhere in Australia, but having spent the last 10 years in, in Chile and Peru and the 10 years before that in Indonesia, etc., I think we've got to go chasing economic systems, not... not, not uh, what, did, what was your term, Phil? Um, Starved. Yeah, I don't like that term. So I think, sorry, I like the term, I don't like spending money exploring for them. So I think if we're chasing porphyries in Australia, then the Macquarie Arc is where you need to be. And if we want to do it undercover, I think you do it where we're doing it. So if we look at where we are, you can see our current tenement map sitting there, all 100% owned tenements in the northern part of the belt. So of the Juni Narromine Belt. So north of what's been known for a long time as the, the Narromine Complex around Narromine itself, we're pushing that even further north. All of the targets we've generated are on open ground, 100% owned open ground, or they, sorry, they were generated and then the, the, um, the tenements were picked up. And we're taking a portfolio approach here. We don't have all of our, our, um, our eggs in one basket. We're attacking this from a portfolio approach, drilling new undrilled targets. All of these are brand new. And I can tell you, our guys are sitting in Vancouver, our ch Chairman Wendell, right down to our wonderful fieldy out there in Trangy Margus, 
every one of us is excited when one of our holes is about to hit the basement because we don't know what's out there. You know, this is new frontier territory and we're all explorers, you know, so this is, this is as good as it gets and as much fun as you can have, I reckon. And we're chasing things with real potential, you know. Our goal is another Cadia district, another North Parks district, and maybe the variation, the Lake Cow district, we'd, we'd take any of those. But we're drill testing these targets as quickly as we can and as cost effectively as we can with a really drill intensive program and then we drill early and we walk away if we don't see what we like to see. So this all started in, in 2017 when at that time it was the Ramado group who is Douglas Haynes uh, driven. So some of you will know Douglas and know of Douglas's work way back in the Olympic Dam days. Um, subsequently, you know, in um, a couple of those I had on that map there, Ernest Henry uh, in the Western Mining days, Cannington in the BHP days, more recently Kamoa Kakula. So Douglas has a history of finding large-scale deposits by taking this, this uh, theory uh, or this, this approach uh, in covered regions. So in 2017, Douglas took the public domain pre-competitive data, and I, I should give a shout out, I'm, I forgot to on the first slide, one of the reasons we're here, one of the big reasons we're here is because of this fabulous pre-competitive data we have in Australia. We've raised our money in principally in North America and they're blown away by what we can do here with free data. So it's a great, we're an example of that data actually being you now invested in Australia. We're giving people jobs, we're drilling holes on that data and that should not be forgotten by anyone. So apologies for the ad there, but anyway. Um, so that early interpretation in, in 2017 by Douglas generated these sorts of interpretations here, pushing, pushing the, the, the interpreta interpreted geology to the north, concentrating on trying to define lithologies, obviously trying to define the, 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 the extensions of the belts from the mag and the gravity structure, and then concentrating also on areas where he felt that there was areas of magnetite construction and destruction because we know that's the sort of principal geophysical character of the, of the productive districts. Some modelling around the, the depth of cover, and then that generated a, a list of in, initial targets, and some of those targets then we went back and we flew 100 metre space lines, uh, magnetics on those to refine the interpretations. And on the right you can see you know, why Douglas focused on, on this, this area here. We've got all, all the black dots, the swarm of, of black dots here are the public domain drill holes, and you can see in our tenement package there's a handful of drill holes down through here, but the vast majority of this enormous tenement package has not got a single drill hole into it. <coughs> Sorry, did not have. So then after those initial group of targets were, were developed and the original, the, the, the more closely spaced magnetics was flown, the interpretations were refined, uh, again using that same sort of approach. The standard stuff, you know, um, magnetic inversion modelling was used to, to refine the, the locations of the areas of potential magnetite construction, the potential areas of magnetite destruction, and then drill, initial drill holes targeted on, on both those, those uh, magnetic, the magnetic character and also just trying to give us a coverage in each of those, those targets that we, that we liked. And that's the, the style of interpretation that led to the specific targeting there in, in uh, sort of 20, 2018, 19. Um, and now moving to sort of what we're doing after we've developed those targets. Uh, there were 23 initial targets developed and then subsequent additional targets have been developed. So we had a, we, we've a combined portfolio of 31 targets there in, our, in that broad tenement package. 18 of those have been drilled to date, and we'll talk about a couple of those here in, in a little in a minute. Um, and the approach has been to drill mud rotary uh, drilling through the cover, and then short-ish diamond tails on the bottom of that mud rotary hole. And the, the de lengths of those, those tails varies um, from a, because of, of what we're seeing, but typically in the order of 10 to 30 metres and we've drilled a small number of, of, of deeper holes there. Typically we drill two or three targets, uh, two or three holes in, in each target to get a look and then if we're seeing interesting things we'll come back and, and follow those up. We're typically drilling these holes for 20 to 30 grand a pop, so these are kind of like somewhat deep rab holes, and I think I remember John Holliday telling me once that in the Cadia district, a Newcrest rab hole was 700 metres long, um, and we're drilling, yeah, these are essentially just fairly deep rab holes, uh, getting the information in the basement sequence uh, and then trying to trying to squeeze the maximum amount of information out of each of those holes. So we have a pretty standard sort of geological and, and geochemical uh, sort of list of criteria we use for, for stop 
or go or continue each hole. And our average cover thickness here has been 175 metres across the, uh, the, the, all of the holes we've drilled. So certainly not an impediment to the economic development of one of these things if we found it, and not really a great impediment to the exploration either. And contrary to, to some of my fears, and certainly some of the things that were expressed to me, I remember in the, the most recent mines and wines at Walga pre-COVID, pre a lot of people were saying, you guys are mad, you know, you're going to have all sorts of trouble with that cover, you're not going to get through there, you're going to waste a lot of money. It's just not been the case. We've, we've drilled greater than 90% success rate here into the cover. It's not been a problem at all. And to the extent that you can see there, we're actually now drilling angled holes. So we're drilling angled holes through the cover where we feel we, we want a bit of, bit of cross uh, target sort of uh, coverage as well. So I think that's a success in itself, that committed to drilling with really good drillers and really good people supervising those rigs, we've been able to do this. You know. So just to move into, into one of our, our targets, and, and this is all public domain, we've, we've released all of what we're talking about here if you want to go and have a look at our website. So this is the, the Trangy Mile Mundi uh, target area here with the town of Trangy just sitting, sitting to the south here. And it was defined initially on, on the basis of this, this sort of complex magnetic pattern sitting on the, the edge of the, the interpreted arc here. And, and if you tweak these magnetics, you, know, you, start, you see that the complex patterns that are characteristic of certainly North Parks, where I cut my teeth, and, and the Lake, uh, Lake Kale and, and Cadia, et cetera. So that's where the initial target was, was developed. And the first pass drilling there is, has, has, has has intersected some really encouraging things and we'll talk about some of the, uh, that over the next few slides. So we've intersected an intercalated basalt to andesite volcanoclastic and, and in, with a uh, sequence with you know, coherent intrusions into that. The geochemistry and the petrography suggest that some of those rocks are very similar to the, the Macquarie Phase II, the Ganombla volcanic uh, rocks. And they're intruded by a, a, an evolved uh, or a, a, a complex sort of suite of uh, diorite, Monza diorite, uh, Monza granites. And the petrography, of, um, someone else I didn't acknowledge here is Tony Crawford's done uh, quite a bit of petrology for us, so we bring that local expertise as well. And there's certainly indications there in, in, of small volume intrusions uh, with the geochemistry and the petrology similar to some of the Macquarie Arc phase, phase four volcanics. And you can see the drill coverage through there around in a range of the, of the, the magnetic character uh, around, right around the railway line there in Trangy. If you drive that road, you'll see it. And what we've seen in terms of, of the alteration and, and suggestions of the development of potential mineral systems, we've seen really quite widespread and strong early potassic alteration. We see, as I said, that diorite to Monza granite intrusive complex that is consistently potassically altered. So that's a critical point in my mind. We see, see the hematite stained albite bearing alteration that's, that's critical, and Anthony mentioned that earlier, that, that around some of the mineralised districts. We're seeing abundant and widespread sulphide, uh, pyrite dominated with some local chalco, and Anthony mentioned you know, these systems, as we know, are sulphide poor in general, but we've seen enough sulphide around to know that, uh, know that there's uh, something interesting there. And then we've seen local sort of porphyry style veins, EDM veins, A veins, B veins, etc. So we're seeing definitive sort of porphyry style systems, uh, porphyry style signals. Critically, in my mind, what we see is also the veins and the alteration predate the, the major tectonic fabrics we're seeing here. So these are not late sort of systems that you know, we don't know exactly how, what, what event those tectonic fabrics relate to, but we certainly have tectonic fabrics overprinting the main alteration features, which I think is really important. Um, we've got copper, peak copper up to 0.6% to there. Within a kind of broad area where we have quite a lot of copper in the kind of excess of 400 ppm sort of level, and again, Anthony, thanks for speaking before me because I'll draw everyone's attention to, I think it was slide 12 in your talk, where you looked at the, the, the copper content in the sodic alteration around Ridgeway, and we're talking 30 ppm, 50 ppm, etc. So we're not too perturbed uh, yet. We'd like to see more copper, obviously, but uh, we don't believe um, our, the results we're seeing are, are certainly not outside the realms of what you would expect to see in these districts at the kind of peripheral scale. And we think there's abundant room here left in, in this Trangy Mile Monday area. And just re remembering this is sort of one of our, our multiple targets that we're talking about. And I've put there a, 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 a mag image from, from the North Parks district at the same scale, just to point out what we're dealing with here. So you can see E26 here to 22 and, 
uh, 27 here, 48 in the middle. We see that sort of scale there and this is the same scale. So we have drilled quite a few holes here, but we would argue we've still got plenty of room for a Ridgeway or an E26 or an E48 in this target area. And just to look at some of the rocks there, on the left those three panels look to that, to that uh, intrusive complex that we see there, the top uh, sort of Monza, Monza diorite uh, porphyry. These early hornblends are just absolutely shredded with or filled with shreddy, shreddy biotite. All of the mafic minerals are, are potassically altered and we, we, we fractionate down to this, uh, this Monza granite sort of phase here. These return mid Ordovician uh, zircons. And on the right here we see an example of one of the volcanic fasces, a hyaloclastite sort of fasces in a, in a, in a basalt, basalt and then a, a coherent probably subvolcanic in porphyry intrusion into the, into the volcanic sequence, not unlike the sort of things you'd see around, uh, around North Parks. And in terms of the alteration here and, and mineralisation, the top panel uh, shows a, a vein, of a, a chalcopyrite dominated vein which was, was from that sample that ran the, ran the 0.6. Um, and then we see a range of the, the alteration features that we see throughout, the, throughout this little, little district here. Yeah, these these uh, albite, sort of hematite stained albite halos and, and, and more pervasive sort of versions thereof. Complex kind of overprinting relationships here with, with biotite and, and this albite and epidote, uh, overprinting earlier epidote. Yeah, again here, later epidote overprinting albite rich alteration with, with uh, biotite kind of veinlets etc there. So lots of stuff going on. And then local examples of more sort of classic sort of porphyry style veins overprinted here by a, by a later epidote vein. And on the bottom, an example of where we see these early veins being disrupted by those tectonic fabrics. And also where we see a, penetra a pervasive penetrative cleavage, the alteration uh, predates that cleavage. And so we're seeing lots of, lots of things that you'd like to see there, but we want to make sure we, we extract the maximum amount of information out of every metre we're, we're drilling here. So we've, we've, done, we've also undertaking sort of what, what might be considered sort of specialist studies if you like. We think they're now becoming sort of routine parts of the explorer's toolbox. So we've, we've undertaken uh, a reasonable amount of sort of green rock type work that Josh Phillips, uh, Codes graduate, one of Dave's students, uh, has led for us and Josh has done an amazing job in helping out, firstly just pulling apart the, the parogenesis of the, of the green rock environment, the chloride epidotes and then analysing those and putting them in the context of all of that work that's been done there, done, done there principally out of codes over now 15 or more years. Probably the thing I want to point out here firstly is, is I'm, I think we're moving towards an understanding of, the, of the, the parogenesis of the green rock environment, but I think the thing that stands out for us all is how complex it is. We're seeing multiple overprinting events of, these, you know, of the, the epidote chloride overprinting various types of albite bearing alteration, overprinting uh, early potassic alteration, etc. So I think, I think it was Greg that mentioned this morning, you know, and Dave also, you know, good porphyries tend to be multiphase. Now we haven't seen lots of multiphase porphyry veins with chalcopyrite hanging out of them yet, but what we see is multiphase alteration and veining. And I, you know, I, I like when I see, see these sorts of rocks, so complex rocks. And we've done the, the sort of suite of, of green rock type geochemical mineral chemistry here. Just one quick example on the bottom there, our, our rocks in the, in the coloured circles there, plotted in, the, in arsenic antimony space. This is um, uh, against the North Parks data here in the, in the, in the, the grey cloud. So, so our epidotes are sitting within the place where you'd like to see uh, fertile epidotes if, if you follow this story. And we've also done a small amount of, of uh, sulphur isotope work following on the work that, that Alan and, and others did there at Cadia and Paul Heather say previously at North Parks that showed that, that, that there's a consistent uh, variation in the sulphur isotopes related to the, to the reduction of a, of a magmatic uh, or, or an oxidised sulphate bearing, bearing fluid to form the pyrite. This is our, these are our data here and you can see a really nice range clustering around, around about zero per mil uh, and trending down into values of, of, of negative of minus five per mil or thereabouts. 
Um, so this gives us encouragement that our pyrite is likely to be magmatic, magmatically derived, so we're not dealing with kind of some other strange pyrite that has no significance from a porphyry perspective. And it also gives us encouragement that we're seeing that, you know, that potentially seeing that fractionation and we can maybe start to use this as a tool. So we don't have enough data yet to see if it's really going to be a fantastic vectoring tool. But I think as a minimum it, it provides a bit of a screening tool. Do we have magmatically derived sulphide here and can we start to use that? So that's one of the things that, that Josh has also been helping out with. So I'll just very quickly touch now on, on sort of where we're headed. So we've all seen versions of these uh, exploration triangles in the past. So this is, this is our version. Um, and we've, we've, we've kicked out a bunch of targets here where we've, we've, we've drilled, we haven't seen what we like, so moving on. We've drilled a bunch and then that we've got, we've got some, of, some of those that, are, that we think deserve further attention. And then we've got a bunch that we still need to, need to be drilling and I'll just give you a, an example of a couple of those. One of those we have here is what we call Duck Creek. It's about 75 k's or, or thereabouts uh, north of, of Trangy. We like, um, we really like the magnetic signature here. So this area here, very complex sort of curvy linear patterns in the, in the magnetics. Uh, sitting here, this is the gravity on the right, so this is the main part of the, the gravity that marks the arc coming up here. And we've got this, this pretty prominent um, uh, gravity low feature sitting in here, which we, is about the same scale as the gravity low that sits under North Parks, and we think is a potential analogue for, for that North Parks uh, more fractionated intrusion that sits underneath, and where we're heading into this area initially here. Uh, where we're going to be drilling in and around some of these, these curvy linear patterns here in the, in the Duck Creek target. Another one is a little further north, Fairhome target, Duck Creek's down here, Fairhome up here, which is a long strike from the Macquarie target, which has definitive Ordovician age, altered Ordovician age volcanics been dated, um, and we're basically a long strike drilling some, some sort of complex mag patterns in, in there as well. And then one more, we're pushing well north, which is, is even higher, uh, you know, less, un less known I guess, but well north here, right in the northern extremities of the, of the magnetic complexes. Um, and a lot of this has been driven by the fact that we now know we can drill through the cover sequence cost effectively and we can push this, this approach even further north. So we're looking forward to getting into those at some stage down the track as well. So just last slide. Yeah. We're, we're chasing the giants here. We, our goal is to find another Cadia, another North Parks, and we're genuinely spending good money, but with, right, with the right team and the, and, the, and the right approach, we think, to, to make sure we're maximising our probabilities of, of success. Um, and keep watching the website, and uh, you guys will know very soon after we do if we, uh, if we intersect the, the big one out there somewhere. So thank you very much. <laughs>